Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to episode number 23 of the Smart Nutrition Made Simple podcast. I'm your host, Ben Brown. And today we have Stefan Kazo. Stefan is my buddy from Kilo Strength Society in Huntington Beach, California. And Stefan has spent the last 24 years perfecting his work. He has a strong formal academic foundation, earning a bachelor's degree in exercise science from the University of Montreal, and has recently published his first book, 66 Strategies to Program Design. In his career, Stefan has personally trained professional athletes in football, baseball, and hockey. Uh, Here are some of the athletes he's worked with from the NFL, MLB, NHL, Stephen Jackson, James Butler, Mark Clayton, David Fries. The list goes on and on and on, and Stefan's impassion is for program design like I've never seen before. His program design is carefully structured with literally every possible component taken into consideration to ensure the trainee reaches and not only reaches but exceeds their goals, making his work a combination of both science and art. Today, Stefan and I chop it up about the benefits of strength training as it pertains to fitness, fat loss, muscle gain, overall health and longevity and how he's taken his 20 something years of experience and really created an unbelievably uh, unique approach to strength training, how he's created a group training environment that appeals to the general population, utilizing the techniques that he's been using for, for years with those professional athletes. So if you currently are a personal trainer, if you are currently working with a personal trainer, if you currently do any kind of resistance training, then you're going to want to tune in and listen to this episode because you're going to find a lot of value in it, especially about the the minute details of what it takes to create a good, long-term, effective strength training program. I hope you guys enjoy and find some useful information that applies to you that you can implement immediately, but as well as share it with those that you love. Assuming you do, we would like nothing more than to have a positive review and go ahead and subscribe. And with that said, I will see you on the interview. Steph, what's up, my brother? How you doing? I'm good, Ben. Thanks. How about you? I'm good. I'm good. It's good to see you again. Good to talk to you again. What's been happening in the world of Kilo Strength Society? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, we've opened a gym uh, January 9th of this year. So it's been going on for like 10 months now. Uh, It's slowly growing. It's doing well. Uh, Our primate group classes are like starting to fill up and people are liking it so far. Um, People are progressing. Uh, we, We also have our trainer education Thing. So we have like uh, training camps and we have a two day seminars uh, once a month on the weekends. That's uh, getting traction now. So it's, it's doing well. Good. I want to, we'll come back and I want to talk about specifically what the primate is and your trainer education courses and exactly what your gym is focused on. But I'm interested in finding out more about how you guys got into the position of opening Kilo and kind of a little bit about your background, Steph. And how you got, how you got so into strength training from the very beginning? Yeah, I mean that's a that's a good question. I mean, I early on, like as a kid, right? I mean, uh, born in '77, so growing up in the '80s and seeing like uh, people like uh, Van, Jean-Claude Van Damme, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Stallone, like, uh, and even the toys. I, I don't know if you remember He Man. Yeah, of course. That was my favorite toy. Like they were so jacks and it kind of like got me into the whole training thing. And it started, you know, with bodybuilding influence. I started training. I was 11 and then it morphed. Like once I turned 14 and morphed into like more performance training for uh, American football, I was a running back. And, but I've always had that love for bodybuilding at the same time. So, um, and it, it evolved from there. You know, I, I, at 14, I knew I wanted to be a strength coach. I was watching, uh, you remember, like it was on Saturdays, it was called the This Is the NFL or something like that. Yeah, vaguely. Yeah. Because, yeah. Like Steve, Steve Sable was like the, the, the guy. And, and I, I remember watching that show one, one Saturday morning and they were showing the brand new uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers training facility. 
and you saw their strength coaches and like NFL players like training in it. And I'm like, wow. And because I was so much in love with football and all that stuff, I'm like, man, this, that's, that's what I want to do when I grow up. So every step I took uh, at school, um, like uh, university and all that stuff was with the focus on being a, a strength coach. Like I remember like uh, exercise science at University of Montreal, the way it works um, in Canada is, I'm pretty sure it's the same here, but the first two years are, are like that, that you, that, that you want to be a phys ed teacher or, or being in health or sports, it's common, right? Like you have physiology, anatomy, whatever. But then by year three and four, that's where you kind of guide where you're going and everybody was going in health or a phys ed teacher and I was the only one out of 170 students who chose sports as my uh, venture and people were like you're crazy there's no there's no opening there's no jobs into that I'm like but my dad was a gu guiding guidance counselor so my dad always told me if you're passionate about something you'll figure it out so uh, you know I, I went I took the sports venue and just evolved from there and did like the continuing education after and all that so how did you get into, because you've trained a, a number of very successful professional athletes and you're obviously very good at what you do. How did you get into working with those athletes? Yeah, I mean, I was fortunate um, with uh, the continuing education I did in the early 2000. Uh, you know, like it was, it was a different time. So everything was like live in the class, right? Like the, the exams were done in the class. You had no open books or anything mm -hmm. like that. So um, I, uh, one of the exam I did, I scored like, uh, like the, 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 the guy giving the course said, if you guys find a mistake in the, in the exam and you find a mistake, you're going to have bonus points. So I ended up scoring like 110% on the exam. So it caught the, atten the attention of the guy and he invited me for lunch the next day. And he asked me if I was interested in ever working in the United States. And I'm like, well, sure, because my love was always American football in, in Canada. I mean, besides from NHL, there's not much pro, because even the Canadian Football League, the guys don't make enough money to afford like a trainer or anything like that. So I took the opportunity, uh, I did the, uh, uh, they invited me for a weekend long uh, job interview and I got the job and I moved to the US and right off, right off the bat, I started training NHL players because they had a bunch of St. Louis Blues players. And, and then it was like all like word to mouth. So, you know, you start training like Blues players, yeah. then one of the players, his kid went to the same school as one of the Rams player. Yeah. And yeah. then he brought in the Rams player, the Rams player liked it. Then he brought in Steven Jackson and then yeah. it just blew up from there, you know, just word them out. So then, so a large percentage of your career has been dedicated towards developing the high performance athlete. And now you've made a transition into, uh, well, well, tell us about kind of what, what, what has the transition been and, and how is it correlated into what your existing facility, Kilo Strength Society, is? Yeah, so, I mean, I, the first seven years of my career as a trainer, I was dealing with Gen Pop mostly, in a com big commercial gym in Montreal. So I, have a, I still have like a, a good experience with them and then it transitioned to uh, professional athletes. And when I... When I uh, started working at Polican Group in 2012 uh, and I started teaching classes, what I noticed is when you talk to a lot of coaches from all over the world and successful coaches and successful business owners, what I've noticed is there seems to be a trend with the younger generations, especially like the, the, the early 20s, there seems to be a trend towards strength, you know, like like baby boomers and stuff, they're, they kind of use training because their doctors said so or they, they want to be healthier, they want to lose weight. But when you look at the, uh, the young 20-year-olds, like they, they want to have a big squat, they want to have a big deadlift and all that kind of stuff. So I'm like, well, if this is a trend and people seem interested by that, I don't want to develop a business that caters to baby boomers because in 10 years from now, they're, they're gone. Mm -hmm. So I want to build a business that can grow with that youngest generation and teaching uh, the training, the different training camps at Polican Group and seeing how people were so excited about all the strength programs. I'm like, well, why not do this in a group setting for Gen Pop 
that still caters to strength, that still uses a lot of the methods and techniques I've used with pro athletes, but that is accessible for the, these people so they can train and feel the effect of it, feel like they're doing athletic training programs, but it's still accessible to them. So that's what I try to build. Yeah, absolutely. So why strength training is so important for the general population to be implementing? Why do you think it's, why do you think the desires there, what do we know about strength training and the benefits that, that people are starting to migrate more towards strength components than what maybe in the eighties we previously would have looked at as more cardiovascular exercise or stuff like that? Yeah, that's a great question, man. I, I think, you know, when I, when I studied my bachelor's degree, like most of the teachers, most of the professors were from the seventies, right? So yeah. a lot of, a lot of their studies and a lot of their background was in aerobic work. But I think that since uh, the early two thousands, there's been more and more research done in weight training. Uh, there's more content, there's more information, there's more proof of the benefits of it. And uh, one of my uh, favorite uh, strength authors, Dietmar schmidt uh, he, I think he puts it really well. He says, strength is the mother of all qualities. And I truly believe that. So if you're stronger, uh, you'll have by default more endurance, you'll have more speed. You'll have... So I think, I think just people like they, they see it, they feel it, they like the feeling of being stronger uh, and what I like about strength too is it's very tangible it's not abstract it's a number you know it's not about feeling a certain way or or looking in the mirror I think I lost some fat I think mm -hmm. I gained the muscle it's it's a very tangible thing so uh, to, when you work with people and you can tell them wow like your squat improved like 20 pounds since the last two months or whatever it's tangible they see it Right. So I think people like that. Yeah, I would agree with you. It's, it's great to have those objective measures and, you know, for, for stuff in our life that is seemingly so subjective all the time, we don't have a lot of things that we can truly measure or at least though we don't put the emphasis on measuring it from a resistance training or strength training standpoint for the general population to have some structure in their life of, of things that they can tangibly measure, like you said, I think it has a tremendous carryover to just daily confidence and, and growth mindset um, and productivity to say nothing of obviously the health benefits, which, you know, we'll, we'll get into it in a little bit. Um, now, you know, the, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the Smart Nutrition Made Simple show is obviously we're not talking about nutrition, but but like I said, there's so many there's so many health components um, and so many health benefits of strength training, and you do such a good job. Um, you're just you're so passionate about strength training. You always you always have been, and and you've you know, you've done an amazing job of kind of marrying the science and the art of strength training. What, you know, what are the qualities, like what should people be looking for? What are the qualities of a good strength training program that people need to be aware of? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's hard because the, the problem is writing one program, like a program, it's not, it's not that complicated, you know, and it's as long as you cover like the general basis and you follow certain principles of like uh, neurophysiology where like you would start the first exercise with the one that has either the, mo the most velocity or the most motor units involved and then you titrate that down through remedial isolation exercise. If you follow that for the most part, you'll be fine, right? But where I think it's a little bit more complicated is building a year of training or yes. years of training to make sure that you're consistently progressing in that. And that's where it's, it gets a little bit more complicated. And, you know, you have to make sure that you have, uh, you're very systematic and well-rounded in the assistance exercise and the remedial exercise to make sure that everything always builds upon it itself, that you're progressing linearly in your training because, you know, if you, if you only, for example, if you only build like, up, like one upper body session, and let's say we're assuming you're doing two upper body sessions a week 
two lower body sessions a week. And you're building your one upper body session. And then you're choosing your chin up, you're choosing your rowing exercise, whatever. Then people, wow, wow my workout is great. It makes sense. Everything is complementary, but not necessarily because that workout has to be complementary to upper body two as well. Because you're, you're building yes. a... You're building a micro cycle. You're not just building one workout. So you have to make sure that both upper body workout, everything is complementary. And then if you do that consistently and systematically over time, then you're going to have a much broader uh, development than someone who just thinks day to day. And then if you look at the, at the end of the year, like that guy might look at all of his programs and he's like, wow, 80% of the time I ended up prescribing medium grip medium neutral grip rows 80% of the time. So miss, I've, I've missed out on a bunch of variations that I should have used to have like this upper back development that I'm looking for. So it's, it's, you know, like training, you have to look at it on a macro instead of. And, and why should the general population care about thinking about their programs from a macro scale? I mean, you know, the nature of the beast is that most is that there's a lot of trainers out there just on a whim saying, you know, not necessarily having a program design in place and just saying, Hey, you know, today's boot camp style session is X, Y, Z. And it's what all their friends are doing. And, you know, they've had a few people get good results. So why should someone necessarily care about, doing a more systematic structure with their program, having their, you know, having their trainer implement this type of program versus going to the boot camp classes down the street. How is it going to affect them? Like, what would they notice? That's a good question. But the, the thing, I, the way I like to see it is whenever I have a new client or I train somebody, I always think in my mind that this will be a client for life. Okay. Because the different, like if you're training somebody for a bodybuilding show, let's say, and he hires you and is like, okay, I have a bodybuilding show in 12 weeks. Well, okay, it's just, we're just talking about 12 weeks. But most general pop, their goal is they want to train for life. Mm -hmm. okay? So if you want to keep a client for life and if you want them to train for life and have success training and reduce the incidence of like a pattern overload type injuries, you have to make sure that you're very systematic because if your client, if you're just like going through the motion of writing programs or, or like doing like the workout of the day without any type of structure or thought into periodization, the problem is after a year, your client's going to look the same, feel the same, have the same amount of strength. So why would that client stick with you? Why would he renew for another year when there is no true progression? But if when you're systematic and when you focus on numbers and you actually show numbers and you see progress, then the person feels way more secure or, or they feel like their, their return on investment was worth it because they're going somewhere for once with their training. Because to me, it's about retention and making sure that people want to keep training all the time while still avoiding injury, but progressing at the same time. So, yeah. so what, are the, what are the things that you guys implement with your specific program design that helps people overcome potential injuries, pattern overload, like you talked about, the typical postural imbalances that we see in day-to-day -day life? Because I think a lot of people are concerned, a, a couple things. So I think a, a lot of people are concerned that strength training would potentially cause them to get injured. Um, and therefore it's something that, or, a, a cert, or having to um, use, you know, a certain intensity level that would cause them to get injured. And I feel like that's a big limiting factor. So what are some things that you guys implement with your training methodology that may actually be the you know, opposite of that? Yeah. Uh, so Alexandra and I, like we, we have like 20 years experience as coaches and we've coached a lot of people one-on-one. -on -one. So I think, the first thing is making sure that your clients are have proper technique when they're lifting, right? So that's always the number one thing that we focus on, coaching beyond everything else. And then people have to know how to load properly. Like the general population, usually they, they don't know how to load. 
So it's either they grossly underestimate and for months and months and months they're working at 40% of their RM and doing reps and nothing happens, or they get carried away and they're using too much weight. So we emphasize coaching and loading first, but then as far as the program is concerned, structurally speaking, I think the big advantage of our primate group classes is that we use a 14-day micro cycle. So within a two-week period, we have eight different workouts working on eight different motor patterns. So, and it only repeats once every 14 days. So it, it, it delays any type of uh, concern that you could have in terms of pattern overload, because it's not like we're doing like flat bench press right. every, every week, every workout all the time, which that could lead to, especially on extensors. When it comes to upper body extensors, you have to be very careful to have a very broad spectrum of angles because that can lead to injury. So we, we have that in our built in our structure. And then to add to it, like we usually uh, split our training into the A series, which are primary exercises, the B series, which are assistance exercises, and the C series, which are remedial. And the definition of remedial is to cure, right? So we use a lot of that, those C series exercises as injury prevention, rehab type stuff. So a lot of isolated like rotator cuff or scapular retractors, neck, things like that, that we're going to train to make sure that people uh, are bulletproof. So what are, what are some of the, what are some of the benefits that you're seeing with the clients that you guys are, are, are typically training um, when they're, when they're consistent with their strength training programs? Well, I mean, the, the good thing is the, the way it's set up, um, I mean, people get like drastic strength increases. And like I said earlier, that's tangible. So they see that. But at the same time, like they, the, uh, the, the, the use of the remedial exercises, like, for example, there's this one client who had like crazy, like a rounded shoulder mm -hmm. you know, sitting at a, at a desk. And now it's been four months. And, you know, with, without just by doing the workouts, the group workouts, without necessarily like paying attention to this specifically, like he's noticed how uh, improved his posture was just from like, you know, good training practices. And then like at the same time, we have like a ex retired NFL player who retired from the NFL and he was because of an injury and he was told he was never, ever going to be able to squat again a day in his life. And now he's been with us for seven months now. And he's, he's, he's almost squatting like uh, the full range of motion and he's he's doing over like 315 pounds on his squat now so you know like they they feel they it's not just they feel the benefits but they see the results yeah yeah so what what are some of the common misconceptions in out there about strength training that you think are worth addressing hmm. i mean uh, and and you know one is one classic one is is fear for women to go in and strength train for the fear of the, the fact that they're going to get big and bulky. Right. Yeah. So yeah. is that, is that a legitimate concern for women? See, like, no, I don't think it is anymore as much as it used to be, at least not with the, um, the people we cater to here, but it is, it is a misconception because the truth is like women, they don't have the same uh, testosterone levels. They don't have the same uh, uh, neural efficiency to recruit all the motor units uh, needed to grow. And usually most women, they will gain mass, but it's the most of that mass will typically occur in the first three months of training. Then it kind of plateaus a little bit. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I, don't, I, I just don't feel it's as big an issue nowadays, especially not with the younger early 20s generation. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with you. And again, it's because it's more generally accepted that we should be doing some type of strength training and resistance training exercises as opposed to just long, slow cardio and stuff like that. And then, and then of course, if they're manipulating their nutrition appropriately, then they're going to be losing body fat as well. So even if there is a mass gain, you know, while on the scale, we may not see much of a change. Someone's actually getting smaller. They're taking up less space, right? They have less body fat, which ultimately is what 
I feel like most people are looking at yeah. or, or more concerned about than, than just what they're seeing on the scale. So, yeah, I mean, fat loss is, I mean, to me, fat loss though, like the key is definitely nutrition, you know, like t talking about mitts, you know, I, I just, I don't think that doing a, a bunch of high rep training is necessarily the key to fat loss. I mean, I think most importantly is to make sure that the nutritional concerns are addressed. And then like if you're active and you train hard, uh, no matter what it is, I think that body composition over time tends to kind of adjust itself. Yeah. But I don't want to downplay the, the benefits of strength training, uh, you know, because of what we know, like, yeah, if you're active, then obviously it's better than nothing, but, I am of the belief and why I find so much value in what it is that you guys are doing and just strength training in general is, is because of the physiological effects and how it directly correlates to weight loss and fat loss and better um, glucose management and reduced risk of cardiovascular disease and less visceral body fat. And, you know, to say nothing of the health and longevity benefits because there's so much amazing research coming out now of just identifying that people who are stronger live longer, right? Yeah. They have better bone density, bo uh, bone mineral density, which is something that people progressively lose as they um, get older. Um, they have better glucose metabolism, so they handle blood sugar better. And the more muscle mass we have, uh, the better they absorb and utilize the sugars that they take in from their diet. Um, obviously, uh, you know, the, the cognitive benefits, I mean, there's, there's just, uh, just so many that we're well aware of. So I think that it's really important. And again, this is a reason why I wanted to have a conversation with you is because I want people to understand that they should be implementing some form of strength training in their, their program. And like, I'm, I'm not poo pooing, you know, long distance running or cardiovascular exercise in general, but just understanding like, you know, the, the, the long-term benefits of strength training, it's something that absolutely every single person should be doing to some degree. Um, and so having people like you guys that are obviously extremely knowledgeable from a scientific standpoint on how to effectively build long-term training programs is, is really beneficial for everyone listening. So yeah, no, I mean, you know, you're, you're 100% right. I mean, the, the benefits of strength training on a health perspective are like almost endless. And, you know, like your, your example with um, as you're getting older, a lot of people are under the impression that, you know, like sometimes like people in their 80s or something, they, they get out of breath climbing a flight mm -hmm. of stairs and they, they associate it with, oh, I need to work on my cardio. Well, it's... Right. It's not necessarily that. It's just at that point, they lost so much strength that to climb that stair, it's almost like doing a 1RM squat for them, right? So it's, yeah. if, you, if you keep them strong over the long haul, then even like uh, tasks like this are way more manageable as you get older. Yeah, and, and honestly, it's, it's something that, you know, it hits close to home for all of us at some point. So, you know, when we're younger, it's like, aesthetically, we want to, you know, look good. We want to have muscle mass. We want to be like He-Man and Arnold Schwarzenegger and, and Jean-Claude Van Damme and, and, you know, and be manly and stuff like that. But as we get older and as we enter, you know, later stages of life, it's about health and longevity. And now for me personally, it's not even so much about me, but it's about my dad and my grandma and, and, you know, just, just the knowledge of saying like, look, if you would just go and do some machine resistance training a couple days a week, it's going to have a significant carryover because what happens with most people is as they get older, their weight either stays the same or tip in America, typically they're gaining weight, which means they're gaining body fat. Yeah. And we know they're losing muscle mass and bone density as they get older, which means that muscle mass is being replaced by more body fat. Um, which is obviously no good. So people are getting sicker and sicker and just having some more consistent strength training as their form of exercise would be, would be really, really beneficial. Um, so anyways, uh, <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> but but that, see that that's a good point, and that's also why, because most of my career I've always worked one on one, you know. But that's also one of the reasons why we wanted to create a group training setup, uh, where like the the fees are are um, accessible to most people, so they can have. So when they do train, it's not just once or twice a week, like they're doing a frequency that allows them to keep progressing over time, which is like four times, like our system, the way it's set up, it's four times a week. And mm -hmm. that's a, a, a good frequency for most people to get results. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so Steph, a little more personal. I'm, I'm interested. Um, I'm interested who have been some of the biggest influences for you throughout your career. Yeah, I mean, without a doubt, the number one most inf influential uh, person was Charles Polican because uh, when I first read uh, one of his articles in Muscle Media, 2000 in 1997, I was just so intrigued by the, you know, like double station supersets, A1, A2. He had a four-digit temp. Well, it was a three-digit tempo at the time, but he had a tempo for for your reps he had an actual rest period and you know i was used to reading a program like bench press three times ten that's it yeah. there was nothing else to it so i was very intrigued because i'm like wow that's it's so much more detailed and then when you start look uh, reading more of his stuff like yeah the, the science background behind it was very interesting so he kind of got away from like good old like empirical bodybuilding to science-based strength and conditioning. Uh, so that was the main influencer. Then, uh, obviously, uh, uh, Larry Vinette was the first mm -hmm. coach I ever hired. Uh, he was a bodybuilder in Montreal. I learned a ton from him. And what was interesting with him is he did courses with Charles in the early 90s uh, before Charles even like kind of developed course content. So he... He kind of brought that in, that background to his bodybuilding training. So for me, it was a good mix because I was so in love with performance, but I also had this this love for bodybuilding as well. So he was a huge. I trained with him for seven years, from '98 to 2005. So I learned a ton from him. Cool. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. That it's. I always like to hear, you know, the background. Um, about who who's been the biggest influencers for for people that are doing such great things in the in the industry so i can certainly appreciate those too uh, steph what are some failures that have set you up for success later on if you don't mind sharing failures that set me up for success well <laughs> i mean I, I i do not have the greatest genetic in the world i mean uh my dad is six feet tall, 170 pounds. My mom is five foot six, 105 pounds. I have like small bones. Uh, I made. I lived in Africa when I was. Uh, I was in Burkina Faso when I was eight and nine years old. And when I got back at the age of nine, uh, I missed out on so much food, and because of lack mm -hmm. of education, I ate so much crap that I got pretty fat. And when you get fat as a prepubescent, what happens is your fat cells multiply; they don't just grow in size. So anyways, so my biggest failure has to do with struggling so much to get results in the weight room that I really had to uh, fight my way in figuring out the proper way to train to finally get results. And I think that sometimes when you're so genetically gifted in, in training or whatever it might be, you don't need to struggle as much. And if you don't struggle that much and everything comes easy, then it's harder to sympathize or, or find links with your clients. You know, like if you've always been lean and shredded and eating whatever, and then you have a client that has some type of metabolic syndrome and you tell him, oh, just eat like me, it's easy. Well, yeah. No, you need to understand where he's coming from. So I, I think that was very important for me because I, yeah, I mean, and you know, like in, in my teens, I was one of those that because I was overweight, I thought that eating one or two meals a day was the greatest thing ever. So I would always skip breakfast. I would train for two hours. Nothing happened. Nothing happened until like everything got fine-tuned in my early 20s. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think those are the things that make us the best of what we do is overcoming our own struggles and having to really learn from those and using that knowledge to influence other people positively. And um, so what is some of the best advice you've ever received? Yeah, I, I would say that the we have to go back to 2001 and I did a private consult with Charles in Chicago. And one thing that he told me at that point that stuck to me is he's like, Steph, as a coach, you always have to make sure that whatever you create, you could actually sell one day. You have to create something that's sellable. And what he meant as a strength coach is you have, you need to have data because if you're, so if you train people and you don't record thing, a thing, like what can you really build that somebody at one point at one day in your life could be like, I don't want that. Right. So it kind of stuck to me. And that's why I've always kept all of my, all of my clients numbers and charts and I have all of those. It's a, I have over 16,000 like, programs with data that I've accumulated and that's and I've used this to build uh, all my training system because it's actual tangible data so that I've, I've always been obsessed with that but it came from that 2001 console yeah I've, I mean I've never met anyone who is and I say this as nicely as possible. I've never met anyone who's as big of a nerd about their program design as you are in terms of, I, I mean, it's, it's really unbelievable and it's almost, if it's just, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty impressive. It, it, the, the degree with which in time and effort and focus and structure that you put into your workout programs, but it's also program programming out, you know, years upon years of, of systems. So I, I think that's a perfect segue into, I'd love for you to talk about how you developed the primate system and exactly what that is. Yeah. So, um, so I, I, I basically took the, the system that I do when I train all my pro athletes and I found a way to make it accessible for gen pop. But my biggest challenge with uh, doing group training was that you cannot really periodize um, on a, uh, in, in theory, you can't really periodize group training because you might have a client that joins January, you have a client that joins August. So it, it couldn't be a linear periodization. So what, what we did, Alexander and I, is we've built two years of periodized training so we use all of the methods that I use with athletes. The only methods that I don't use in the primate group training are uh, supra maximal eccentric. Cause it would just be crazy to do in a group setup, but otherwise I'm using everything. Like at, you're going to do like some speed strength method. You're going to do some isometric methods, some eccentric method at one point or the other, but everything is incorporated in that two year structure. So that once you go through two years of training, you're going to touch everything. It's all like planned out like that, uh, but it's not necessarily like uh, periodized in a common way where like you're doing your eccentric and then you're following with speed strength to peak. Uh, you can't really do that, but at least the clients are going to touch everything over time. And uh, what I also wanted to make sure is that all the group training would run smoothly. So we built, so that two years worth of training, it's 384 different programs. And we created the programs before we bought the equipment. So now every machine that you see here is because it's going to be used at one point in the training. But also what's good is you're never going to have more than two people at any given time on a specific machine. So you don't end up having like eight guys on the lying leg curl or anything like that. Um, so that's, that's how it came about. You know, it was a lot of thought. Yeah, clearly. So what are the primate for those that aren't aware? Yeah, so the primate uh, lift, so it's the eight primary exercises. You have the squat, the front squat, the deadlift. You have the overhead press, incline press, bench press, decline, uh, dip, and uh, chin-up. So these are the eight lifts. 
and they're they're like the A series, they're like the basis of each and every program, and those those are rotated every two weeks. So yeah. those those never really change because they're primary exercises, and to be good in in the multi joint uh, exercises, you need rehearsal, you need practice. Um, so by not changing those, but still using a fourteen day microcycle, it allows clients to repeat the pattern over and over and over to perfect their technique, especially something like back squat, which requires a lot of uh, mobility. You know, if you don't really practice very often, it's really hard to get good at it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. And obviously I've spent some time with you guys and learning from you and I'm continually impressed with just the level of information quality of the systems that you've put in place. Um, Steph, what, so you guys have a gym called Kilo Strength Society in Huntington beach now, and you're running group, group training classes. Now, what can someone do if they're interested in working with you guys, but obviously they don't live in the area? Yeah. Uh, so you, I mean, you can, uh, reach out to Kelsey at info at Kilo Strength Society for any type of questions. But the other services that we offer, we have, uh, I mean, we sell programs on our website. So if you're just looking and in, into having a good like program on strength or hypertrophy or whatever, you can get those on their website. Otherwise we, we do a uh, one-on-one, we do offer one-on-one and we also offer um, online training. So mm-hmm. like one-on-one online training, uh, we and we also offer education, so five day training camps and two day uh, program design center. Yeah, you guys. So you have uh, your online training, which I'm. You know, I currently do your your uh, your your program design courses. Um, I've done the online training, and you know, honestly, one of the biggest for the, for those of you listening, one of the biggest regrets I have as a strength coach is not finding. Uh, Steph and his training methodology sooner in my career. Um, honestly, I, I feel like it would have taken me to a completely different level so much earlier um, and saved me so much time and effort and failures, um, which of course I'm grateful for, but I, I really, one of my biggest regrets as it pertains to my personal training career was uh, was that I didn't start studying um, with you guys earlier. So for those of you listening that, you know, that may apply to, or you're looking to take that next level in your personal training or strength, you know, strength and conditioning career, save yourself the time and effort and just start, start learning from the guys over at Kilo because it, it is legitimately the best in the industry. So thank you for that stuff. Legitimately. Thank you. But you know, when, when you were saying that I'm a, I'm a nerd with program design, I mean, the greatest example is, because you're talking about long term, like I actually I created a 16 year periodization that I use like every time like I have like a like I have this young football player, 17 that started with me. I start him with 16 year periodization because in my mind, that guy is going to make it pro. He's going to train until he's retiring. So this, I always think long term with training. Uh, yeah, and I think that's a great a great tip for, for everyone as it relates to their training and their nutrition and their lifestyles. Like we're so quick to just jump on the latest fad. Oh, we're going to do the 300 workout. We're going to do whatever. We're going to jump on and do a, a hardcore whole 30 nutrition plan. But it's like, ultimately, where's that going to take you? And, and wouldn't it be more effective to think a year or five years or 10 years down the road as to starting to implement those those habits, those guidelines that are going to serve you well for the entire time rather than doing something and then being set back and getting a little bit of results and then getting injured. And so, I, I mean, I feel like that's the right way to, to like, look I, at it. You're right. I mean, I, I think one of the biggest flaw or weakness in the, uh, the Western world strength and conditioning is there's no true continuity. Like if you look at like uh, Russia back in the days, you know, like they would take a kid, like starting at 12, they would train him under the eyes of Zatsyorsky or whoever it was, but it was like structured. They would train them all the way through the Olympics. But here, like you have a kid that goes to high school X. He trains with strength coach Y. 
He's doing functional training because that's what he likes. Then he moves on, he goes to play at Nebraska, and now they have a different strength coach, and then all of a sudden they're all about Olympic lifting. And then he makes it to the NFL with Atlanta Falcons, and now they're doing yoga and, and bodybuilding training. So there's no true continuity. So it's really, really hard to build like beasts when you're going all over the place with your training. So something like long-term structured, scientific-based, in the long run will give you a much higher peak than just doing a bunch of 12 week this 30 day that like you like you said yeah yeah start young and and even for kids you know i i mean even with my kids you know i my my girls are 8 and 6 and and you know we even just for them to just go through the motions to start to create more body awareness to understand what it is to start to push themselves and and train at a higher intensity we're, we're not obviously using heavy loads or doing high intensity movements or anything like that but it's again just from a confidence standpoint like for them to know that they can do a pull-up yeah. uh, is is amazing for females in general to be able to do a pull-up is an incredible confidence booster so there's so much carry over to strength training and every you know every facet of daily life that for those of you listening that don't currently strength train, but think you, you know, it may benefit you. I would encourage you to, to get started. And if you don't have a place, um, you know, to do it, then reach out to the crew over at kilo strength society.com. And that may be a good, a good place to start. Uh, with that said, Steph, thank you, brother. I appreciate your time. And thank you, Ben. And, uh, it's always, uh, you know, it's always great catching up with you. I appreciate everything that you guys have done to support BSL Nutrition and, and the Smart Nutrition Made Simple podcast. And, uh, and um, I'll touch base with you soon. Perfect. Thank you. All right, brother. Take care. So I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Smart Nutrition Made Simple podcast. If you did, then go ahead and like and subscribe below. And if you're listening on iTunes, then make sure you subscribe to our channel. And if you love the content that we're putting out there, then leave us a five-star review. It's really the best way that you can support us in our mission to get the best quality strength, nutrition, fitness, and supplement information out there so that we can help more people. We appreciate you. Please continue to listen. And again, like, subscribe, and share this with your friends. Thank you so much. We appreciate you and your time and catch you on the other side. Bye.